Did you know that the largest number of memoirs written by former members of new religious movements are Jehovah's Witnesses? What exactly are new religious movements? Well, let's take a little glance over here at Encyclopedia Britannica. So it says that new religious movements are the generally accepted term for what is sometimes called, in the pejorative sense, a cult. So if we scroll down a little bit, they are characterized by a number of shared traits. <clears throat> I won't read all of the traits, but some of them are, they are regarded as countercultural. So they are perceived by others and by themselves to be alternatives to the mainstream religions of Western society, especially Christianity. If we scroll down, the new movement is usually founded by a charismatic and sometimes highly authoritarian leader <clears throat> who is thought to have extraordinary powers or insights. Many new religious movements are tightly organized. In light of their often self-proclaimed alternative or outsider status, these groups often make great demands on the loyalty and commitment of their followers and sometimes establish themselves as substitutes for the family and other conventional social groupings. Uh, does this sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> So back in September, I began doctoral studies in education. And the reason why is because I wanted to do um, a research study on the therapeutic benefits of writing memoir, um, because that's something I'm in the process of doing myself. And anytime you do a research study, uh, you need to choose your participants, who will be the ones that you're studying, the participants um, of the research study. So for the last few years, I've been doing a lot of reading of memoirs written by former Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, because that is the, the religion of my upbringing, and I was, I was curious. And that started with reading The Reluctant Apostate by Lloyd Evans, followed by uh, Crisis of Conscience by uh, Raymond Franz. And then I started thinking to myself, are there any women that have written books about what it was like to be um, a member of that religion and that no longer practice it? So I started doing, doing some research about the women. And I came across several uh, memoirs that were written by women. I've read quite a few. I'm just looking over at my library. I have um, Leaving the Witness by Amber Scora. Uh, the Last Days by Ali Miller, Shunned by Linda Curtis. I have a whole bunch <laughs> on, on my bookshelf that, um, that I've read, and they've been really enlightening and, and insightful. So whenever you do academic research, you have to position yourself in, in the research. And one of the, the terms of positioning yourself refers to being an insider versus an outsider. So in my context, I'm an both an insider and an outsider. An insider because I understand the, the terminology, the you know what it's like to be raised that way. So I have an insider's perspective. But because I haven't been a practicing member of the religion for the last 25 years, I'm also an, an outsider. So I have maybe a little bit of um, more objectivity or maybe I'm not as, not as um, emotionally invested as I used to be. And yet, really, that's only kind of been a process that's happened, breaking free from that emotional connection in the last few years since reading these memoirs. So uh, they have really helped me. So I'm an, I'm an insider, outsider researcher <laughs> of, the, of the witnesses. So when I first started to research memoirs written by former Jehovah's Witnesses, um, I started with Google and found the Goodreads website, which is awesome because it has um, an itemized list of memoirs written by former Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's where I found several of, of the books that I've already read. Uh, but then I did a deep dive in, on the university's website and I came across this juicy article, which I'll share with you here. 
uh, by Mel Melton and Ashcraft entitled X member accounts from new religious movements, a compilation 2000 to the present. So this article gives an itemized list of memoirs written by former members of new religious movements in the 21st century. So it has many more than just Jehovah's witnesses, but it itemized every single one uh, written in the uh, 21st century. If we scroll down to the subheading of Jehovah's Witnesses, you'll see that there is uh, probably some very familiar names to you if you've, if you've investigated any of these, but it goes on to list 76 um, memoirs written by former Jehovah's Witnesses. And I did some math, I added up um, the the number of of memoirs just so that i could you know have the facts as opposed to just assuming or guessing um, and in one of the articles that i wrote for the program i mentioned here uh, summing the number of memoirs according to religious affiliation revealed that the largest number of memoirs were written by former jehovah's witnesses of the 76 named mem memoirs 50 percent of those uh, were written by women. And this is a relevant, uh, a relevant fact because um, before the 21st century, I did, you know, I, I tried my hardest to find books written by former Jehovah's Witness women uh, before the 21st century, and it was really hard to find books. But I did come across uh, two, and if there's more, please share them with me because I'd love to read them. Um, I found, let me pull it up here. I'll show you what I found first. I found a book. Uh, written by Barbara Grizzuti Harrison, I don't know if that's how you pronounce her name, called Visions of Glory. Um, let me show you, I'm gonna, just gonna flip screens here. Um, Visions, of, Visions of Glory, it's kind of um, a, uh, I don't know, 400 page book with uh, references and an index at the back in case you wanna, wanna look up words. Anyway, um, I had a really, hard time finding an actual copy. The This one is from a, I think it was part of a library and it was sold as a used book, Oakland, an Oakland, Oakland library, um, uh, published by Simon & Schuster, <laughs> New York. Anyway, so, but I did find that you can get it online. So if you wanted uh, to, to read through this, and I definitely recommend that you do, especially if you're, if you're a woman, uh, a former Jehovah's Witness woman, um, you can get it at the archive, uh, online through an archive. And I'll share the link to this book in the description uh, below. But what's really fascinating is that this book was published in 1978 and it shares, it, it's not exactly a memoir, it's kind of part memoir, part nonfiction, I guess, talking about the, the practices of the religion. Um, but it shares her story of uh, being a witness in the 1950s super cool, super interesting perspective. Um, she became, well, started going to the, I guess the Kingdom Hall at nine years old and was in the religion until she was 22. So she similarly is an insider outsider. And she went on to, to write for the New York Times and she was a journalist and an author, wrote other books. Um, but she has a really interesting perspective of what it was like to be a woman um, in the Jehovah's Witness religion in the 1950s. And in fact, she was a, a, a Bethelite um, as a single woman in her 20s at, at Bethel. And I've, I didn't even know that was possible, but I guess things always change as we know in that, in that religion. Um, so she was a single woman living in New York Bethel in uh, the 1950s. But her book is really insightful because it talks not so much about her specifically, although it does, you know, shares her story of kind of coming in and leaving and what she went through. Um, but it talks a lot about uh, what it was like to be a woman 
in, in the religion and kind of the misogynistic practices and, and where they come from. So as a result of, of researching her book, I came across a juicy gem, which maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but let me share it. Did you know that the wife of the founder of the Jehovah's Witness religion wrote a book? Maria Frances Russell um, Ackley, I think was her, was her maiden name. She wrote a book, uh, just a small 64-page book called The Twain One, A Bible Study of a Vital Subject. And this one deals specifically about the role of women in the organization and the role of women um, really in under the umbrella of the Bible, I guess you could say, the interpretation of the role of women um, as, as talked about in the Bible. So again, the Twain one is not a memoir either. So Visions of Glory may be part memoir, the Twain one, not memoir. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that both of these women talk about doctrine and explain doctrine. And that is something that I found I had a hard time finding in, in the books that I've read anyway. And not that that's a bad thing because memoirs aren't really about sharing doctrine, but in Crisis of Conscience and uh, Reluctant Apostate. And then I know there's um, a bunch of other uh, books written by uh, former male members of the Jehovah's Witness faith that kind of dive into doctrine. And to be honest, I learned more about the doctrine of the religion of my upbringing from reading those books than I did as a member in the religion. Anyways, but these books share a woman's perspective into doctrine. Another really interesting connection I made while doing my research was what was happening in history at the time that Russell was forming uh, the Jehovah's Witness religion, what was taking place socially. And that was women's suffrage. So in um, New York, women's suffrage movement, women's, women's rights advocacy started. Uh, really, I think in Europe, it ha the first one happened in Europe before that. But in the United States, um, it was like 1848 that women's uh, suffrage movement began. Right around the time that a lot of new religious movements in Christianity were forming. So in the late 1800s, a lot of change was taking place. Um, and what's really interesting to discover, especially when you look at um, uh, the book Visions of Glory, um, and then Twain One by uh, Maria Russell, Maria Ackley, um, is that they talk about the suffrage movement and not so much the, the Twain one doesn't reference the suffrage movement, but Visions of Glory talks frequently about um, women's suffrage and how uh, Maria, Russell's wife, was referred to as a suffragette, uh, someone who, who was an advocate of women's rights. But what's interesting in, in the Twain one is that throughout the Twain one, she tries to, uh, well, she does explain the doctrine of uh, where submission comes from and, and what the role of women is. So she gives a really objective view of women's role um, under, under her, through her lens of Christianity. So if you don't necessarily subscribe to that belief system, well, you have to read it with a grain of salt. But it's really interesting that she's writing, um, wrote the Twain one at a time when women's rights were being uh, promoted in, in society. So what's also interesting is that Russell did not like that his intelligent and articulate wife, who was a director in the organization at the time and a, and a contributor of writing, um, he didn't like that she had any kind of ambition. Uh, but in the Twain one, she kind of explains that that women should be able to use their talents and, and abilities. So it's really interesting to look at the precedent that was set by Russell, the precedent that was set for all Jehovah's Witness uh, men and women, how they view women and, the, and their roles, that a lot of it was, is based on 
the personal dynamic of the relationship between the Russells, between Maria and her husband, um, at a time when in, in society, women's rights were being um, advocated for. And uh, Russell not liking it, and then kind of setting in stone, no, women, women must be silent and submissive and subservient in their organization, and how that kind of laid the groundwork for where we are today. So even though uh, a lot of progress has been made in many fundamentalist religions, not just Jehovah's Witnesses, um, women are still under that kind of inferior, uh, submissive, subservient uh, position. And I, I, found, I found that really fascinating. And I was really proud of that, that the, the wife of the founder of the religion of my upbringing was a suffragette. Good for you, Maria. So how does this inferiority of, of women within the, in the religion, um, how does it impact women? Um, you know, why do so many women who leave the faith and, and men for that matter, why do they write books? Um, when you're in the religion, you're, you're voiceless, you're, you're silenced, right? At least, at least within the, in the context of being able to express your true feelings and, and opinions about, about, uh, maybe doctrine and, and women's roles. Then if you decide to leave the faith, you're also voiceless. You're also silenced, silenced through shunning. So one of the best ways to share your voice is through writing memoir. Uh, and what I've noticed uh, in the research is that a lot of the memoirs that have been written have been written by, I want to say, um, American women, Canadian women, and women from the, the UK. Um, I don't claim to know every every single book that's that's been written, but it would be great if we had um, a more diverse group of women that could kind of talk to the lived experiences of different niche groups. Women write books. They also uh, do things like create videos, like like this one. There's uh, several women who have become activists in their own right, uh, sharing their voice through video. And both writing a memoir, uh, creating videos are what are called expressive therapies. You're using um, a creative means to express yourself for therapeutic benefit. We might not even realize that we're doing it for therapy because that might not be the intention, but often that's the outcome. We feel catharsis from expressing ourselves. Um, and it may even, you know, you might, you might create a bunch of videos, get things off your chest and then decide, eh, I'm good now, you know, be, and it had the therapeutic effect. Expressing yourself had therapeutic effect. Uh, but definitely writing memoir, something that uh, you can leave for others to read and, and benefit from is um, a, a really valuable way to contribute to the uh, happiness of others to contribute to the the peace of mind of other women. So in my research, I came across an interesting word um, that I'll share with you that that talks about how some are viewed that read memoir um, and really maybe anyone that watches true crime and so on. Um, so let me see if I can highlight the word. Yeah, so let's pull it up here. It's called uh, Schadenfreude or Freud. I'm not sure how, how you pronounce that exactly, but it's talking about uh, critics of readers of memoirs accuse the readers of finding pleasure in others' misfortunes. But the point that I make is that women who read memoirs written by um, women who are, you know, have similar lived experiences may recognize their own voice and find solace through reading these shared experiences. Um, I also share the, uh, about the benefits of, of writing a memoir. There's a part uh, that where critics, because critics always have something to say, uh, that some critics, accuse authors of 
memoirs as being self-indulgent nasal gavers, uh, gazers. <laughs> and I, I have to say, I, I disagree with that. <laughs> so some of the, the benefits of writing memoir and the benefits of expressive therapy um, through research, <laughs> what it shows is that people have control over pain, depressed mood, and pain severity. Um, as well, it helps the author to identify and work through feelings, improve relationships, and learn new things about themselves. Furthermore, expressive writers report finding purpose and meaning in the suffering and adversity while developing a narrative identi identity through storytelling. So there's multiple benefits to, um, well, writing a memoir, uh, but also reading them. They, they, we, we, uh, find our voice sometimes, not always, but there might be elements of someone's memoir where we're like, that happened to me. That was my experience. And it's, it's a less isolating feeling. You feel, you feel heard <laughs> through, through someone who doesn't even know you that you may never meet. And relating to, you know, women helping other women through writing and reading memoir, uh, it, it reminds me of a quote I came across in this book, um, Writing a Woman's Life by Carolyn uh, Hi Hel Helbrun. I'm not sure how you pronounce her name. Sorry about that. Um, but it's a quote by Adrian Rich, where it says, uh, page 68, in case you want to know, um, it is only the willingness of women to share their private and often painful experiences that will enable them to achieve a true description of the world and to free and encourage one another. Um, and I think that's really valuable and really important. You know, we often, um, in my own experience, because of, because of the attack I experienced, um, I'm very vocal about it. I do a lot of public speaking and, and women will approach me and say, you know, um, something happened to me. I was attacked or, or violated in some terrible way, uh, but I don't talk about it. But they feel less alone, less like, it only happened to me, no one else can understand. When you read experiences of others, you realize other people do understand. Another quote that I wanted to share with you uh, comes from this book. If I could put it up here. Can You Hear Me Now by Selena Cesar Chavin. Um, now, this is a memoir about her uh, lived experience um, really as a black woman in Canada getting into politics. She was our, um, our, our MP for the community that I live in. I've met her. She's a fantastic speaker. Uh, so when I saw that she wrote a memoir, I was like, oh, I got to read this, this memoir. So there's a special quote um, in this memoir that I wanted to share with you because it, it'll kind of reinforce the value of sharing your voice uh, with, with other women, whether that's through memoir or um, video or whatever way you, you wish to share it. So she says, while being interviewed by David Letterman on his Netflix show, My Next Guest Needs No Introduction, President Obama said, Part of the ability to lead doesn't have to do with legislation. It doesn't have to do with regulations. It has to do with shaping attitude, shaping culture, and increasing awareness. His words describe the purpose I'd found in politics. I could review acts of legislation and vote on them with the 337 other people present and did. But the ability to speak up about issues that brought pain to people was not just my responsibility. It had become my motivation and my calling. I'd found the perfect intersection of my past pain and present purpose. Politics gave me the platform to amplify the voices of the quiet little black girls who felt and saw injustices and could not say anything. It gave me the platform to speak to young students who were struggling to connect with their immigrant parents while carving out a space for themselves in the world. And it gave me an opportunity to tell women that I saw their pain and hurt as well as their beauty and strength. This quote by uh, Selena was just fantastic. What I ended up doing um, when I was when I was reading her book at that point, I closed the book 
I walked over to my computer and I applied for doctoral studies because I thought I want to use my voice to help women. It's not just, you know, something nice to do. It's, it's something I have to do. I feel like I have to, to, to share elements of, of what I've gone through, my lived experience, my pain uh, with other women to see if I can help make a difference. And in, in that respect, it's not just so much about being a former Jehovah's Witness and all of the um, hardships that come along with that, particularly leaving, being shunned, uh, but I'm also sharing my, my lived experience as a, as a victim of, of violence. Um, so full disclosure, I applied to the program, I got in, I started in September, and then I withdrew in January. <laughs> So I'm no longer a doctoral student. However, what I've learned from the research that I did and my motivation to use my voice to help others, what I'm going to do instead of write a dissertation for an academic audience, um, I'm going to write a, a book for a more public audience, more, more of a general audience, uh, while still using a lot of academic resources. Um, and then you never know at some point I might, I might rejoin the ranks of a doctoral student, but I'm getting old and it costs a lot of money. So it's not that important to me. Um, but definitely sharing my voice is important. And another thing, um, that I'll mention is that, uh, some women, yes, write memoirs, uh, to share their experience, particularly former Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who've experienced shunning and a lot of the pain of, of being, um, being a woman in the organization. But another thing that quite a few women do is they become doctoral students and they write dissertations about shunning. And there are several dissertations um, on, the, uh, on the topic of excommunication, shunning, uh, the emotional abuse experienced um, uh, by those who are, are shunned. And a lot of those articles I have um, on, on my computer and are using, I've used a lot of the, the research from those, those articles uh, to kind of form the basis for some of the arguments that, that I'm going to be making. So what are some of those dissertations and articles that I'm drawing on here? I'll, I'll quickly share them um, on screen in case you're so inclined or have access to a university library. I'll also list them in the, in the description below. So um, one of the thesis is a qualitative exploration of the social dynamics of religious shunning in the Jehovah's Witness community uh, by Wendy Grendel. Uh, there's another one leaving the jehovah's witnesses identity transition and recovery by heather ransom uh, that's also a dissertation um, and then there's i know there's more but the ones i, I have on my computer um, uh, all deal with shunning the the impact of shunning that seems to be the main um, issue that academic articles uh, refer to uh, so i'm just showing showing some of the ones that i have here um, because it is clearly one of the most uh, difficult and painful things that uh, former Jehovah's Witnesses experience when they leave. And, and actually, th this term social death, um, I, I found that really, really interesting uh, one. So you might want to research that, the, the experience of so social death from leaving the Jehovah's Witness religion. Um, so bottom line is you don't you don't necessarily have to write a memoir um, maybe you're someone who is more inclined to go um, to post-secondary and do like a master's thesis or, or a doctoral dissertation about your experience um, so that it's more academic and less personal you can you can certainly do that too either way I would say it's a form of expressive therapy because you're expressing yourself and you're making meaning of pain and adversity. And uh, what the research shows is that when we do that, it helps to um, not neutralize the, the negative thought processes, but kind of take, takes the power out of them because we, we look at things in a mindful way with a little bit more objectivity and, and so on. So um, 
Uh, the, the final thing I'll, I'll share is what are some of the themes, the common themes of, of memoirs written by uh, former Jehovah's Witness women? And um, these themes are, are things that can be teased out in different videos. So I will do that um, in, in the future. But let me share with you some of those themes. Shunning for sure is, is one that, uh, like I just showed with the academic articles, that seems to be the main one that a lot of people focus on and through every memoir that I have read there's always the theme of shunning because it's the most painful uh, thing to experience we have that that social pain um, uh, fi family dynamics which is you know impacted by uh, shunning and then gender roles and equality and then you'll see the, the final one, number nine, empowerment and activism, right? So that often happens uh, when people leave, they, they feel like they have to tell people and they want to get out there and be, be activists and create videos. And, and I think that is fantastic because in all honesty, it's, it's thanks to the activism of, uh, in particular, Lloyd Evans, um, that really helped me to wake up and start to go down this this research rabbit hole, as they say. Um, but then many other activists that I've that I've followed um, on YouTube as well. So these are some of the of the things that we'll, we'll look at in greater detail in future videos. Um, but this channel is, uh, you know, will deal with that as as one of the themes. But it will also talk about memoir in general um, and how we can, you know, share our voice. Uh, through through writing and talk about the the benefits of of memoir writing um, and I while I don't claim to be be an expert in that because I'm working through the process myself I thought it might be helpful to to share uh, some of the things that I'm learning along the way so if there's any topics that you you'd like me to dive into research share information on please feel free to share them in, in comments I'd be, I'd be happy to do that put my research hat on and, and do some more things uh, to the benefit of women out there and um, on that note I'll end with be positive